At CES 2020, EVGA announced they're bringing an RTX 2060 to the market at just $299, undercutting the existing 2060s by about $50. In fact, this turned out to be part of a larger announcement by Nvidia that the RTX 2060 reference card is now going to match that at only $299. This is of course all in response to AMD's announcement that the RX 5600 XT will be available later this month. So in the RTX 2060 KO, are you getting the same quality card for your money or did they cut a couple of corners to make that price point? Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. And as I mentioned today, we're gonna to be taking a look at the all new EVGA RTX 2060 KO. Now, EVGA has used the KO monkeyer on graphics cards before, but you'd be forgiven if you don't remember it. It's from all the way back in the 8800 GT days of around 2007. The KO card was essentially a high-end graphics card with a couple of stripped down features to make a lower price point, giving you the best possible performance per dollar. And that's exactly what we have in the RTX 2060 KO. It's sporting the same Turing architecture from the RTX 2060 reference card, has the same number of CUDA cores, tensor cores, and ray tracing cores, has the same six gigabytes of GDDR6 running at the same 7,000 megahertz clock. So what is the difference between the RTX 2060 KO and say an existing RTX 2060 XC from EVGA? Honestly, not a whole lot. Now you can obviously tell the card is quite a bit shorter. However, the board is identical in length as the back half of this is simply a heat sink with a little bit of a backplate to it. That is one premium addition that the KO card actually did receive as it does have a full metal backplate, whereas the XC card does not have a backplate at all. Moving around to the front of the card and you can see the most glaring difference in this card and that is the lack of one of the display ports. That's right, the RTX 2060 KO only has a single display port, a single HDMI and a DVI port. Meaning that if you're looking for full multi-monitor support, this probably isn't the card to go with. Now, when I first started examining these, I thought they were using the same exact board. However, this does turn out to be a full custom card. Uh, you can see looking on the inside of there, there's a number of capacitors in very, very odd places. So this is certainly not the same design as the XC card. However, it is almost identical in size. The XC and the KO both have a twin fan design. However, the KO has a significantly smaller heatsink in here. As far as how that affects the thermals, very happy to say the KO actually ran a couple of degrees cooler than the XC card, much to my surprise. Under a very long sustained stress test, the XC card peaked at 69 degrees Celsius, whereas the KO peaked at just 67 degrees Celsius. So much to my surprise, chalk up another win for the KO. But enough about the physical differences between these two cards. How did the RTX 2060 KO stack up against an existing RTX 2060? Our test bench for today is gonna consist of a Ryzen 7 3700X eight core 16 thread system running at stock speeds on an ASRock Phantom Gaming 4 motherboard. There's also gonna be 16 gigabytes of Guile 3200 megahertz memory and a one terabyte PCI Express 4.0 NVMe drive. Starting with 3D Mark Time Spy and the results are, well, not surprising at all as it performed exactly as an RTX 2060 should. Scoring a 7582 in graphics score against the 7891 of the EVGA XC card. Now that is a difference of about 300 points, however, it is only about 4% of the total score, and honestly, saving $50, I'll take a 4% drop. Moving on to Port Royal, the new ray tracing benchmark inside of 3D Mark, and the KO card actually scores a minor victory over the XC, proving that that 4% disparity in performance is not going to be universal across the board. It pulled out a 4297 versus the XC's 4264, so pretty equal performance. Now, I didn't run my full benchmark suite on these two cards as I was just trying to suss out the relative performance differences between them. And on the three games that I tested, they were virtually identical, scoring within about 1% of each other across the board, with victories going both ways. The one difference that did crop up was inside of Doom, specifically the 0.1% lows at 1440p. The KO card scored a full 20% lower than the XC card. I'm not really sure what caused that as the boost clocks were reaching pretty much the same levels between these two, with a 1980 megahertz on this card and a 1995 megahertz on the XC. So there you have it. Outside of a couple anomalies, the performance on these two cards is virtually identical. Now you do get fewer options as far as monitor hookups with the KO card, and there were a couple discrepancies in performance that did lower it down. Again, the Doom 1440p, and for some reason it scored about 4% lower in Time Spy. However, I don't think that's enough to justify the $50 of stepping up to the higher end XC card. 
There are advantages both ways in this case. With the XC card, you do get that extra display port, so if you are looking for multi-monitor support, this is probably the card you're gonna have to choose. However, if you're a single monitor user and you're just after the best performance per dollar you can get, the KO definitely has that going for it. It has the same dual fan design, had actually slightly lower temperatures, pretty much identical performance across the board, still only requires a single eight pin power supply, has a back plate, is quite a bit smaller, and is $50 less. If you are interested in picking up an RTX 2060 KO from EVGA, Amazon affiliate links will be down in the video description below. Make sure to follow those. Every dollar you spend on there really does help out the channel. And that is going to do it for this episode of Craft Computing. Thank you guys, as always, so much for watching. Make sure to like this video if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't like it, and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter, at Craft Computing, to keep up with my daily shenanigans. And if you are interested in financially backing the channel, make sure to look me up on Patreon. A minimum donation of $1 per video gets you exclusive access to my Discord server. Thank you guys so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. And cheers to you, too. Yeah. Today's brew is Lagunitas Brown Sugar, and it is a 10% brown ale, if I recall correctly. Uh, it is quite the heavy hitter at uh, 10%. Boy, for being called brown sugar, uh, it's not the sweetest of aromas. A lot of malt, though. A lot of malt. Ooh, I take that back. That is uh, very sweet, like cheek puckering sweet. Whew, that's pretty good. Boy, this is sweet, super, super boozy. Um, if you're not a fan of that, that dark ale booze taste, uh, you are not going to like this. Um, I personally think it's wonderful. Uh, it is, uh, you can certainly feel all 10 of those percents. Boy, letting this warm up just a couple of degrees, now there's a sourness that's kind of taking over the back end that's rather unpleasant. The front of it is still sickly sweet. Like if, if you are a fan of very sweet drinks, uh, this is not bad, although still very, very boozy. However, I'm getting more of a sour mash once that initial sweetness goes away. It fades over the top of my tongue and that's all I'm left tasting is, uh, is this bitter, it's not even like a hoppy sour or that, that hoppy bitterness. It's just this weird sour mash bitter. And I gotta say, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of it. Um, tastes almost like bad celery. A little bit of broccoli in there. Yeah, it's like this weird vegetation bitterness that's just kind of eh, lingering. Yeah, laid into this beer, a little bit warmed up. I'm really not a fan of it. It's, uh, it's getting harder and harder to drink. It's getting less and less pleasant. Um, if this was fresh out of the fridge and I just needed something to get the job done at 10%, this certainly fits the bill, but you're going to want to drink it very quickly and very cold. And honestly, that's just not how I enjoy drinking my beer. I don't drink it to get drunk. I drink it to enjoy the flavor and the journey of it. And the journey on this one, unfortunately, goes south pretty quick.